This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Hi everybody, so it's really my great pleasure to welcome again to ANS, uh, this time virtually because uh, 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 Professor Dr. Sven Günther and Dr. Elisabeth Günther have been so nice to actually give a lecture yesterday to the, to the ANS Summer Seminar. We are very, very grateful for that. And now I welcome you again online. So I'll begin with a brief introduction. So Professor Dr. Sven Günther received uh, uh, his PhD in classical studies and archaeology from the University of Mainz in 2008 with a dissertation on indirect taxes in the Roman Empire between Augustus and Diocletian after having taught both at the high school and university level in different institutions in Germany. He has been working since 2015 at the Institute for the History of Ancient Civilization at Northeast Normal University in Shangkun, China, first as associate professor and then from 2017 on as deputy director. His research focuses primarily, primarily on ancient economic history, numismatics, and didactics. Since 2014, he has been senior editor of the Journal of Ancient Civilization of Changkun University and co-editor of the Marburg Contribution to Ancient Trade, Economic and Social History. He is the auditor, author and editor of 14 books and over 150 articles. Among his most recent publications, uh, Fiscalità ed Epigrafia nel Mundo Romano, so Fiscality and Epigraphy in the Roman World, edited together with Cristina Soraci and Muziris One, Trade and Seafaring in Antiquity, Red Sea, Persian Gulf, um, and Persian Gulf. And I'll just talk about first Dr. Elisabeth Günther now. So Dr. Elisabeth Günther, is a lecturer at the Institute for Classical Archaeology and Byzantine Ar Ar um, uh, Classical and Byzantine Archaeology in Heidelberg. Her research focuses on ancient iconography and theoretical methodological approaches, um, reception studies, ambiguities, frame and affordance theories, and southern Italian vase paintings. Uh, her first monograph, Commissia Bilda, deals with the representation of chromatic scenes in southern Italian vases. <clears throat> She's currently working on her second dissertation, Emblemata, Reduction and Polyval Polyvalency of Visual Language Imaginary in the 2nd third century AD. She's also the auditor of four edited volumes and the author of over 30 articles. And sorry, I would not be more brief on this uh, and please uh, uh, join me in welcoming our speakers so thank you very much yeah thank you very much lucia for this very kind and all too long introduction yes yeah, sorry uh, we are very happy to be here with you all virtually um, and we uh, apologize in advance that we have to switch in between, because we have a little baby project, so to say, uh, waiting next door to us, and uh, one of us always has to take care of her. So please accept our apologies for a small switch in between. Anyway, um, this uh, all, all too high praise might be disappointed when we look at the first slide of our presentation, since uh, you might think that this is a rather normal Roman imperial silver coin, a denarius, uh, showing uh, a member of the Antonine dynasty on the obverse and a personification on the reverse. Yet, if one looks at yeah, the details uh, a bit more closely, one also encounters quite many differences to what we normally see as Roman imperial coinage. First of all, you notice the, the legend 
is in Greek style, so not in, in Latin script. And uh, well, if we go to the obverse, we see that an emperor is mentioned as autocrator, um, K for ca Kaiser, then M for Marcus. Yeah, but then uh, uh, Aurelius, up to then it's uh, quite uh, typical um, titulature of Marcus Aurelius. Yet at the end, you find Verus being mentioned, which is not the normal denomination of Marcus Aurelius. You actually find that only uh, uh, once in an inscription and uh, in Mesopotamian Karai on one specific bronze coin type. And that uh, yeah, astonishment uh, continues, so to say, on the reverse, as not as normal the deity uh, is uh, somehow specified in the legend around uh, this personification, but it's actually a ruler that is mentioned there, a Basileos, Manos, Philo, which can be uh, filled to Philo Romaios. So what we have here is something that at first glance looks Roman, but if you look at further details, uh, it uh, uh, actually shows some diversion from the typical Roman imperial coinage. So what, what is the story behind that? That is uh, in the focus of our talk, and it will be both a historical, but also an iconographical study of these specific coinage of Basileos Manos Philoromaios. By the way, if one looks at the portrait of uh, Marcus Aurelius or Lucius Verus, it's also not clear whether that resembles Marcus Aurelius or Lucius Verus. The hooked nose might be more similar to Lucius Verus, but well, while the overall appearance could be also Marcus Aurelius. So placing this coin into a historical context brings us to a region that uh, one can yeah, certainly describe as fringe or edge of the Roman Empire namely the region between the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire, which you see here also depicted in very detail on the map. It brings us to Mesopotamia and then uh, to very two specific places that play a particular role in the next couple of minutes, namely Edessa. So, sorry, my mouse disappeared, Edessa being placed here, and Karai, while we have also to take into consideration that it's not just the Roman Empire on the yeah, western side, so to say, in the Parthian Empire on the eastern side, but that also Armenia in the northern part uh, or northeastern part plays a particular role. As you might know, Parth uh, Armenia being always a kind of yeah, buffer zone, so to say, between the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire, always diplomatic, but also military issues happened there. And this is actually the case also in the 160s AD uh, in, in that region when Lucius Verus, the co-emperor uh, together with Marcus Aurelius, is going to there to fight the Parthians after these uh, at the death of Antoninus Pius, so the predecessor of Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, had uh, somehow taken over control of Armenia. The story is quickly told. Uh, Lucius Verus marches to there, in between marries uh, his wife, Lucilla, we come to that later on in 164 BC, is uh, placed at Antiochia mainly, which you find here, but from time to time also stretches to the war zone, so to say, but mainly his commanders have to fight there. He is conquering step by step uh, with the commanders back Armenia, is also marching into Mesopotamia and eventually reaches also the capital 
of the Parthian Empire, uh, yeah, Pesiphon, uh, and uh, yeah, burns it down. Uh, what he brings back is not only a triumph and his soldiers, but also the Antonine Black. But this is not what we are talking about today. We talk about this small region around Karai and Edessa, which is the Austro-Anian Kingdom. And uh, in particular, the Austro-Anian kings play a role in this game, yet it's quite difficult somehow to yeah to define what role exactly they have played they are occasionally mentioned in our greek and roman source material um, yet um, already the chronology of these kings is very much disputed it's basically based on two kings lists so to say one having been established by so-called pseudo Dionys of Telmara, writing around about um, yeah, 750, uh, 800 AD, and another by Elias of Nisibis, um, a document or manuscript that has been found at the beginning of the 20th century. And it was uh, Andreas Luther who yeah, discussed in very detail these two lists and try to combine uh, the findings in these two lists to a uh, yeah, regular chronology of these Osro-Anian kings. And one sees, uh, uh, marked in red here, the two main persons we are concerned with today, and both have uh, the first name Manu, but they have different uh, yeah, affiliations. So one is Manu Bar Isat, so Manu son of Isat and Manu Bar Manu. And you see that these rulers uh, yeah, uh, had the hand over the Osuranian kingdom for some years. Uh, Manu Bar Isat for quite a long time and Manu Bar Manu for 12 years. And in between, uh, in these king's lists, uh, in Pseudo Dionys in particular, appears a so-called Vael, Basaru, for two years, yeah, which might be placed exactly at, at the time you know, between Manu Bar Isat and Manu Bar Manu. But all these details uh, are rather yeah, conclusions from academic research than uh, what actually we can, uh, yeah, testify and confirm in our sources. Anyway, this Manu Bar Manu will play now an important role as it now I and many others have supposed that Manu Bar Manu is actually this King Manos Philoromaios we find on the reverse of these coins we are discussing today. And this Manu did not only mint silver coins with Greek legends, but also bronze coins, a uh, few types of which you see in the two following slides. Uh, he is then usually depicted in rather rough style, so to say, on the obverse and on the reverse. Uh, yeah, his name and uh, his kingship are mentioned in Syriac Estrangelo. And uh, more alleging a connection to the Antonine dynasty, so to say, uh, these two types where you have, uh, again, a, a person on the obverse, which yeah, looks rather similar to what we find uh, as characteristics of Antonine uh, rulers. On the reverse, again, the, yeah, the name and title of this Manu. Uh, King Melek in Syriac Estrangelo. One should not be tricked, though, by these uh, depictions, as also this King Vael, about which I shortly talked before, so who rules this two years, probably in between the two Manus, uh, is shown. Uh, on coins, he's actually pro and probably the first one being depicted on bronze coins in that region. And uh, you see 
that he also has uh, features of uh, Antonine uh, rulers uh, being depicted uh, in this left-hand coin on the reverse and in the right-hand side on the obverse, uh, that he probably was not on the Roman side, however, is uh, um, yeah, concluded from his being depicted together with the path thinking Volagase is a fourth on this one type you see on the left hand side. Anyway, these silver coins, not the bronze coins, these silver coins we are now talking about are not just focusing on one emperor only. It's not just one type. It's in fact a series of coins. You find the, yeah, Domus Augusta, uh, the two rulers, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus, being depicted on different types of this series, and their wives, so Faustina II or Faustina the Younger, Marcus Aurelius and Lucilla, uh, the wife of Lucius Verus since AD 164-65 onwards, respectively. You also see in this list that there is actually only one type really attributable to Marcus Aurelius uh, with Mars on the reverse as deity, while Lucius Verus has one or two types, uh, depending on whether you count this yeah, mixture of legend to uh, Marcus Aurelius or Lucius Verus, which uh, I started with. Uh, or three types, sorry, um, I was uh, speaking wrongly, three types or two types for Lucius Verus, one type also only for Marcus Aurelius' wife, Faustina the Younger, and at least six types for Lucilla, which uh, are shown uh, uh, at the bottom to which we come shortly afterwards. My part here concludes with uh, this one type of Lucius Verus that is yeah, not somehow similar to Roman imperial coinage. Uh, at the beginning, we show to you that yeah, very often there are personifications on the reverse, uh, and this is true for all the coins, except for this type for Lucius Verus, where on the reverse of the coin, you have a four-line uh, legend that names uh, King Manos Philoromaios in full uh, in four lines. So that is a very specific uh, type uh, that uh, is only uh, yeah, uh, available uh, to, for Lucius Verus, so to say. Anyway, now we must talk about how similar actually these types are to Roman imperial types. And that's a part of uh, our iconographist, uh, Elizabeth. And I pass the word on to you and go to watch the baby. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Sven. Um, hello, everyone. Um, also from my side, um, I, um, it's a great pleasure to um, present this uh, topic to you today. And um, yeah, as Sven said, we now are diving a bit more into the iconography. Um, and here you see two um, points of this uh, series, Manos Philo Romayo series, compared to each other. And I just want to draw your attention to the obverse. So on um, the upper um, one, I, I hope you can see my, um, my mouse, but I think I, I can also spotlight here um, that you have already seen. Um, and the, the lower one you've already seen, this is um, very probably um, uh, Lucius Verus, but could be also a mixture with Marcus Aurelius. And this is definitely Marcus Aurelius. So you see that both of these portraits are styled very closely to each um, other. And even more close are the wives. So if we see Faustina, the younger, and Lucilla together, you can clearly see um, that the portraits are styled in a very similar way. 
and even the legends running around. So here Faustina Sebaste and Lucilla Sebaste are placed in very similar spots on the obverse. So here seems to be um, a kind of link um, in the design of both obverses. And also on the reverse, um, we see similarities of these two coin types. Um, so this type um, with Faustina on the obverse, remember that we have only this one type for Faustina, uh, shows the goddess Juno on the reverse. So the yeah, main uh, goddess, the highest goddess of the Roman pantheon. Um, and uh, Juno here is offering, she holds a scepter in her left hand, offering with a, a bowl in the right hand. And um, here on the crown is a peacock. This is her attribute, her typical attribute she always has. So we can identify her as Juno. And on the reverse of the coin with Lucilla on the obverse, we see a very similar figure standing here, also with a scepter in the left hand and um, a patera, this um, offering bowl in the right hand, but without any peacock. Um, so the goddess here is not as defined as in the case of Faustina. And since this um, scepter is a bit broader, it is also um, sometimes interpreted to be a torch. And this is why we see here Juno or maybe Ceres on the reverse. But there are types where it is uh, a bit more uh, clear that also Juno is shown on the on the reverse. We can come back to this uh, later. If we look at the portraits, I have said there are some striking similarities. Um, as you know, uh, people doing classical archaeology are always looking for some portrait types. Um, so I was interested in the portrait type of Lucilla specifically used on the Philoromaios coins because all types um, we know, and we will talk about this later, all types um, show the very same portrait type. Um, so all coin types show the same portrait type. Um, but this uh, portrait that is used for Lucilla is none of her official portrait types. So on all the coins, the imperial coins minted, we do not find this type. Um, the hairstyle here is done in a tripartite way, so with some waves in the lowest level, then a very thin braiding here, and then a melon rib-like um, part on the top, and then here some knot in the um, in the neck, and you also here see some strands of hair coming out of this um, hairstyle. And the only close type of Lucilla of Lucilla's um, official portrait in the imperial coinage is this here, but you see very clearly that the braided line, which is here in the middle of the um, coiffure, is here um, just over the forehead. So it's a different portrait type. It's, it's, it's different. So we ask why um, does she have, does um, Lucilla have not the official portrait type um, on the Manos Philoromaios coins. And I think the answer um, lies in again in the comparison with, um, uh, with Faustina. Because if we compare both um, hairstyles, we see in both cases this wave-like pattern, lowest part, then this um, braided um, line here, and then um, Faustina has again some waves and Lucilla has here this melon rib um, part. But apart from this, it's basically the same even here, this little curl coming out of um, the knot. So what presumably happened is that um, the person or the people designing um, the portrait for Lucilla on the Manos Romayos types um, looked at the portrait of Faustina um, took it, but then um, altered it a little bit. So we have a very strong link in the end between Lucilla and Faustina. You could say uh, Lucilla wears uh, um, a bit um, variation 
of Faustina's um, portrait type. And this portrait type um, we see here is indeed an official portrait type of Faustina that was also used in the coinage. It is called the eighth type, according to Klaus Fitchen, who yeah, made a typology and tried to find a chronology of this um, um, of these hairstyles, and very likely this eighth type was um, employed after 162 AD. So in this type, we have a terminus postquem with which we can a bit try to um, find a chronological uh, or the, the 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 time in which um, uh, the Manos Philoromaios coins were presumably being minted. Again, a close look at these portraits um, is interesting because, as I said, on all types minted with Lucilla on the obverse, she has the very same hairstyle. And this is not the only phenomenon because it is not only the same portrait type, it is exactly the same head. So if we compare them, it is very likely that uh, here, um, it, um, they used always the same obverse die for all the coins that were minted for Lucilla. Um, I haven't seen these coins in, um, in the original, so I cannot be 100% sure. So I'm just telling you my observations. But what is very striking in my eyes is that um, the, this lambda here in Lucilla, so basically the second lambda, is broken in all four cases. Oh, sorry here, here, and also here. And also the, the size of the letters um, is basically the same. Um, also um, the facial features and the clothing here of this bust. Um, so in our eyes, it is very uh, likely that indeed there are, um, they, they, they are um, uh, dye links between these obverses. And dye links, we find indeed some more in this group or in this coin series, um, also on the reverses. And here you see a reverse of um, RPC number 6488. Um, the, the piece here in the upper one is in the British Museum, the lower one in Münz Kabinett Berlin. And again, we see striking similarities here. The um, patera, this bowl is exactly uh, next to the epsilon here. And um, the, the scepter nearly touches the Omicron of Manos. And the, this Omicron is also a little bit um, cut into pieces. So again, we think although we have not seen the original coins, that these also share the dice. And uh, a third um, interesting thing we observed is that also these two coins here share the same reverse die. So this is basically the same RPC number, but you can see it's a different figure. So maybe um, there's also a need to create uh, or to um, distinguish um, them into two types. I think, yeah, we can here discuss about this maybe later. Um, but you see that the figure here, again, um, um, a goddess offering, so very similar to Juno, but without the peacock, um, has the offering bowl here exactly next to the Y and the Y, and um, the head is between the um, Nu and the Omicron of um, Manos, and the scepter he touches the sigma of Manos, and here also the sigma of Philoromais, or Philoromaios. So we also think that it's very likely that these are dialings, but now with two different uh, members of the imperial family on the obverse, namely Lucilla and her husband, um, Lucius Verus. So we have already mentioned that this coin series of Manos Philoromaios is modeled closely to the imperial coinage. And I will show you just some examples uh, to illustrate that and to show you that there are different levels of similarities. So what you see here are coins that are extremely uh, similar to the imperial coinage. Um, on the left side, 
uh, the upper coin. Um, you have seen now a couple of times um, with um, Providencia on the reverse and very likely Lucius Verus on the obverse. And this is modeled extremely close to um, coins um, for Lucius Verus and also with Providencia Diorum on the obverse. Um, you see that also um, the style of the figures, the clothing and the attributes are very, very close. And since this um, um, uh, silver denarius um, with Lucius Verus on the obverse was minted in Rome um, from December 162 to 163 AD, um, um, it is very um, likely that these uh, coins were running around in the years uh, 163 or, or later. Now we look at the um, female part, so to say. So the upper coin, you already also know this is the one type that was minted with Faustina on the obverse and Juno on the reverse. And it also has a model from the imperial coinage, again, with um, Faustina the Younger on the obverse. And you see it's basically the same portrait type here and with Juno on the reverse. And then here we see also the legend, the name of the god, goddess Juno. And uh, I have already mentioned that this is the eighth portrait type that was um, very likely created in the year 162. So this is a kind of terminus postquem. And then we have some coins that are a bit more um, detached from the model namely this um, um, drachma here with Lucilla on the obverse and Salos on the reverse, because this Salos here has a um, cornucopia in her left arm while she's offering to a snake and she's sitting here on a throne. And in the imperial coinage, we see basically the same figure, but without any cornucopia. So here, this attribute was added to the figure. On the right side here, you see again the coin um, with um, uh, with Lucilla on the obverse and this Juno-like um, goddess, but without a peacock on the reverse. And um, basically, since the attribute, the peacock is missing, the identification is not so clear. Or you could also say that this goddess is kind of polyvalent. So different deities or different personifications can be depicted with such a figure. And I just chose one uh, randomly. Um, here uh, below the drachma, you see a Sestertius um, with Marcus Aurelius on the obverse and such a goddess on the reverse. And in this case, we can read in the legend that here it means Concordia, uh, Clementia, but we can also find um, this figure, for example, used for Pietas. So I think that due um, to the missing peacock, um, the interpretation is not so clear or maybe should be kept open for different uh, possible interpretations of the viewer or the audience. So here you see now an overview we created um, of the coin types of Manus Philo Romaios and the comparable Roman imperial types. And you see that basically all of the Manus Philo Romaios coins have an equivalent in the imperial coinage. The only um, exception is um, um, the one with uh, Lucius Verus on the obverse and the legend, this four-lined legend um, with Manus Philo Romaios Sven has shown you on the obverse, uh, on the reverse. So this is very uh, extraordinary. Um, well, so if we compare um, Manus Philo Romaios series with the imperial coin types, we can already see that the Manus Philo Romaios coins um, are not just um, a simple copy of imperial coins, but that there is an idea behind it, a concept. So for example, that um, Lucilla is presented as a kind of uh, version of Faustina is um, obviously something that the die cutters invented for that. Also the similarities between Lucius Verus and uh, Marcus Aurelius, there seems to be an idea behind it. And also um, the uh, chosen figures on the re reverse, um, I think show 
that we have here something like um, um, yeah, a bigger concept behind. Um, and we will also uh, shortly talk about that. And this becomes also a bit more clear if we do not only see the Philoromaios coins together with the Roman imperial coins, but also together with another group of coins that was um, likely minted in the same time, period of time, but also in the same area, um, in um, uh, uh, very probably in uh, Karai. And these also have a lot of things in common with the Manos Philoromaios coins. First of all, they are also silver coins, so uh, silver trachums. Then they have um, the portraits of the imperial family on the obverse. Uh, then um, they, as I said, uh, come uh, from the same period and uh, probably area. Um, and uh, then they are also modeled after the Roman imperial coinage. And here you see on the reverse, again, Providentia that you have already uh, met on the um, Philoromaios uh, uh, coinage, but also in the imperial coinage. So these um, coins also have a Greek legend. And on the reverse, um, usually we find the legend of, um, oh, sorry, um, of uh, Hypernikes um, Romaion, um, so um, being devoted for the um, yeah the victory of the Romans, but sometimes you also find um, Hypernikes Tonkurion so of the emperor or so. So there's some um, uh, alterations of that, some variations of that, um, but this basically gives the name to these Hypernikes coins, and on the Obverse, um, as I said, the members of the Rome, uh, the imperial family, and then, as you have seen here, um, Faustina Sebaste, for example, or Lucilla Sebaste. But there are also differences. So first of all, it's um, um, how the uh, the dice um, were uh, turned again each other. So while the Philo Romaios uh, coins are usually set at six o'clock, the Hypernikus coins are usually set at twelve o'clock, and this might already indicate that the Manos Philo Romaios coins and these Hypernikus coins were minted at least in different workshops, maybe also in different uh, places. But we don't have further sources. Um, to um, pinpoint the exact location of the mints. So this um, question must, re unfortunately, um, or luckily, uh, remain uh, open. And another difference is that the iconography of the Hypernikas coins is shows more variations. So this um, regards, uh, on the one hand, the obverses. So for example, the portrait types of the persons shown. Um, but also of the reverses. For example, um, the Hypernikus uh, coins show Armenia, um, like um, in the imperial coinage, and uh, this Armenia um, personification uh, was minted from 163 AD on. So we come into the same um, period of time, um, while the portrait types uh, show a broader chronological range, I have to say. So here you see all together the Hypernikus coins on top, then the uh, Manos Philoromaios coins in the middle and um, below the imperial coinage. And here I think you can see very well um, on the one hand the similarities, but also the differences between, uh, between um, the, the figures um, on the obverse and reverse. For example, here Providentia on the Hypernikus coins um, um, is um, is quite close uh, to the Manos Philoromaios and the imperial uh, type, while we see more differences in Salos. Um, seated Salos um, in the Hypernikus coins has a cornucopia, but standing on the ground, but still she's enthroned feeding a snake. And the Philoromaios type, the, she holds the cornucopia in her hand, and as I have already shown to you in the Imperial Cornish, there is no cornucopia at all. Sorry, no, I jumped in the 
slides. Um, and if we look into this iconography, we find again an important um, difference between the Hypernicus coins and the uh, Philo Romaeus coins. And this I would like to outline a bit because I think it is important for the interpretation of the Philo Romaeus series. Um, and this is um, the choice of the um, personifications and goddesses on the reverse. Here you see two Hypernicus coins with Lucilla on the obverse. In this case, by the way, this is um, um, the, taken uh, from the um, portrait uh, types of Faustina again. Here the first type of Faustina, so was uh, invented in the 140, so it was um, uh, much earlier than the other types. Um, and on the reverse, you see on yeah, the upper one here in the British Museum, um, Venus, because she's holding an apple and a scepter. And in the lower um, example, which is not yet in the RPC, you see also Venus undressing and also holding an apple. So here in the Hypernicus coinage, uh, Venus is uh, very, um, very common among the deities on the reverses of um, the coins minted uh, with Lucilla on the obverse. While if we compare this with the Manos Philoromaios types, Venus is completely absent. So here you see comparison. Um, here always the reverse of the Hypernicus coins. You see here Venus with apple, um, here um, Venus adjusting the drapery or undressing, um, and here Turita Tuke holding um, maybe an apple instead of a globe, which could also be a re reference to uh, Venus, and all of them are missing in the Manos Philoromaios types. And with this question, or with this um, yeah, idea, we come back to the question, so what, what might have been the actual purpose of these coins? Why were they, they minted the Manos Philoromaeus types? And as we have said, uh, one possible explanation is that it was linked with uh, the marriage of uh, Lucilla and Lucius Verus, which took place in the middle of the Parchian War. So and said probably in 164 AD, um, but we don't know it exactly because we don't have any sources that help us to um, pinpoint the exact chronology of, of this um, um, uh, wedding. So this would be an explanation why Lucius Verus and also Lucilla are quite prominent on the points. On the other hand, we miss in the iconography anything that is related to uh, marriage. For example, um, uh, Concordia, so the dextrarum jumptio, shaking the hands of empress and emperor, um, but also Venus or fecunditas. So this kind of concepts there that are very closely linked to the marriage um, are completely absent on the Manos Philoromaios uh, coins. Instead, we find at least two types that are um, related to uh, military. Uh, here you see an interesting um, uh, specimen that was um, auctioned uh, in May of this year, at the end of May, um, with uh, Lucilla on the obverse and Victoria on the reverse. So this is extremely uh, a rare piece. Um, and also in the uh, imperial um, coinage, um, we do not find the link between Lucilla and uh, Victoria. Although we have to say that we are not 100% uh, sure um, whether we should not at least a bit doubt this uh, um, specimen because the weight is very high and also um, the die axis is um, a bit unusual for the Manos Philoromaios coins here. So we haven't of course seen the original one and this is always necessary to um, really um, yeah, answer this kind of question. So we leave the question open here. Um, but there's also a second um, specimen um, 
that was published uh, some years ago. Um, Victoria, however, um, on the reverse, um, holding a wreath in her ha left hand and a palm branch in her uh, left hand, um, approaching to the left, is also to be found on some coins minted um, by Marcus Aurelius, for example, um, uh, this one here, and this is one of the earliest, so it was minted between the December of 163 and the December of 164, so um, we think um, that this kind of um, figure um, yeah, was present among um, the coins uh, running around um, in 164 uh, or 65. Um, although I have to say that this, in this case here, is uh, a bronze coin. But there are also um, other coins showing Victoria on the reverse, and they were minted later. So 166, 167, but um, Victoria already also um, was present uh, under Antoninus Pius. So it is very difficult um, to get um, a better understanding of the chronology. The other um, military type, so to say, is the one minted for Marcus Aurelius uh, with uh, Mars on the reverse. And we also find some uh, predecessors um, of this iconography of Mars under Antoninus Pius. But it was also linked with Marcus Aurelius in the imperial coinage. Um, for example, um, uh, this example here um, was uh, then also minted um, probably in the year 164. And this, again, might suggest a chronology, but we cannot be um, absolutely sure. So, again, uh, we show you here um, a general comparison um, between uh, or a, a general list of um, the uh, types of uh, Manos Philoromaios. Um, and with this, we come um, to the conclusion. And I pass back to Sven. Thank you so much. Um, we have looked at this Manos Philoromaios coins uh, in comparison to the Roman imperial coin types and these Hypernikes coins. And for us, it becomes or became quite obvious that uh, yeah, these uh, coins are closely modeled after Roman imperial coins and also somehow linked to the so-called Hypernikes times. Yet um, there is not a one-to-one -one modeling. There are deviations from both. And this shows to us that this coin series has an own concept. It was created in a fine-tuned way, so to link um, the different themes, the different concepts with each other. The homogeneous look of the Manos Philoromas coins and the high number of dialings, as Elizabeth has shown, suggests for us a high output in a short period of time. And that output can be dated to after AD 163, uh, most probably 165, when we follow how the yeah, military expedition in the Parthian, uh, to the Parthian Empire went on. Also, what regards the yeah, chronology, yet contested chronology, we find for the Osroenian kings. If we can link the bronze coins in the name of Manu with the coins that are attributed to Manos Philoromaios, we can say that this ruler adopted at least two different kinds of communication strategies. One was targeted uh, at a local audience, another one related to the Roman imperial framework. And then the issue of Philoromaios, you know, being friend of the Romans, comes into play, um, resembling the, these imperial coin types and uh, linking that with Philoromaios shows, first of all, of course, the dependency of this Osroenian ruler on the Roman authority. And we have many other attestations of Philoromaios for both the Roman Republical and Imperial history and especially in numismatics. Yet, 
There's an unusual relegation of the titulature of Manos Philoromaios to the reverse. And that's very remarkable for Philoromaios coinages. And uh, it for us suggests that it has something to do with um, yeah, the circulation of these coins. And uh, we thought, I also published that in an article, that it has something to do not with the marriage of Lucius Verus and Lucilla, but that these coins circulated uh, in the war zone market, so that uh, there is also an economic framework to be considered. Anyway, the imperial magnet, so the presence of Lucius Verus and uh, Lucilla, at least being close by in Antioch, um, shows how yeah, this imperial authority uh, yeah, had an impact on these coins and uh, shows how this Manos Philo Romaios was at the edge of the Roman Empire, but wanted to be even closer to the Romans than just at the edge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful, uh, this really wonderful in interpretation and inter very interesting. And uh, I have a question from uh, the audience for we, uh, and then I'll open the floor to further questions. Here, Alex uh, says, any connection asks any connection with silver drums of Petra mm -hmm. under Caracalla and Jetta. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. So uh, actually, we have also coins, the hypernikes types, for instance, for Commodus. Yet the difference is these are then bronze types showing Tuche. Uh, so there is uh, uh, yeah, a continuity with hypernikes as legend, but no, the, the framework totally breaks. It's not silver anymore, it's bronze. Uh, it's a different kind of uh, personification on the reverse. And if one looks to close by uh, cities and territories, one sees not a particular connection. I mean, there are, of course, in other cities, uh, personifications of, uh, yeah, which we find in the imperial types as well, but not as close uh, as far as we have observed and not in such a very dense um, related style, so to say. So um, I think the striking point is it's silver coins. And I think one must put very much emphasis on that. And this was also the starting point when I thought about this economic uh, uh, yeah, impact, so to say, or the economic framework, that this might have something to do with the presence of the Roman army at that time that can be seen at work here. I mean, it doesn't exclude, for instance, that um, yeah, it was uh, originally issued when uh, Lucius Verus and Lucilla married. Uh, you see there are much more types for Lucius Verus and Lucilla than uh, for Marcus Aurelius and uh, Faustina, uh, respectively. But it has, a, it has of course, no, not a very typical arrangement and iconography we see on uh, these uh, marriage coins, let's say. Um, so this suggests that there is at least a second consideration at play. And this seems for us this uh, war, war zone market where these coins could be immediately used. So yes, there is, uh, of course, always a link to personifications. One could also include Alexandria no, as, uh, as a reference, but not as uh, close and interrelated as we might uh, wish to have. You want, you want to add something, Elizabeth? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to add that um, this kind of you know, goddess um, looking like Juno, but without a peacock, where I said it might be something like a um, polyvalent or ambiguous figure um, gives also one the impression that um, maybe they also wanted to leave it 
the interpretation open to some kind of degree. So this would mean that also the, the coinage could fit to different purposes. I mean, also Ceres um, referring to um, um, yeah, to harvest and fertility and so on, you, you can use for different things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so at least uh, for me, um, from the point of iconography, it is not so much targeted to one purpose, but might be there might be um, an openness um, that speaks maybe for different purposes uh, connected, as Sven has said, of course, with the economic uh, needs um, that are um, yeah, linked to, to the uh, Parchian war, basically. I mean, that's uh, the very big uh, thing happening. And I think no one will doubt that it has something to do with Parchian mm -hmm. war in the end. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, I don't see any questions. Can I ask you to actually uh, discuss a little bit more these uh, partian like uh, um, iconography that I saw on one of the coins? Because it's very. Va il coins. Because mm. uh, this is fascinating. Because, of course, uh, as you say, they, they issue actually are one of the very last to issue silver provincial coinage. Uh, but, and of course, you argued rightly that bronze is clearly for a local, uh, local audience. That's why the script is different. But then you also have uh, this, yes, and this is, of course, on the bronze. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, I mean, apologize. very much, very much is um, unclear here. No? So we have this vial actually mentioned in this king's list. But only uh, in the king list by uh, Pseudo Dionys of Telmara, not uh, in Elias of Nisibis. And mm -hmm. there is it, it is said explicitly that this king was installed by the Parthian, or mm -hmm. by the Parthian king, while Manu was uh, absent in the Roman Empire. Now we know that in this list there is confusion between these two different Manus, if I may go back shortly. So you see there is a Manu bar Isad and a Manu bar Manu. And in the in this list, yeah, it's totally mixed up, also the attribution of years. So the this the idea is then how can you make a yeah, historically chronological sense of the coinages? That's why the coins of Vael are put first, being the first bronze coinage uh, to where then, or to which then the coins of Manu somehow respond. Uh, and this is based on um, this uh, particular uh, type showing the Parthian king on the obverse. But as we know that Volagesis ruled for quite a long time, uh, that could be placed, of course, at any point uh, from the 130s to the end of the 160s, so to say. Uh, so here you see how the interplay between coins and historical development function. Uh, you have the idea, okay, at that time, Volagesis is reaching uh, on to Armenia, is also trying to uh, yeah, strengthen his position in Mesopotamia, so he might like to get hand over uh, his territory by installing a king uh, there. Then the Romans come, push away everyone and everything, and then install um, yeah, Manu as king, uh, uh, which who names himself then Manos Philovomaios. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, the reconstruction of that. But it's very much based, of course, on, on uh, establishing these links. It And it has a good sense, of course. It makes sense. Uh, um, what, uh, what is interesting for me uh, is, of course, that the portrait of this Vael 
uh, has some similarities to Antonine portraits. And I think uh, to answer the question, what is, uh, let's say, the cultural Im framework around that, one really has to look at coins circulating in that region uh, in this time. But as we all know, uh, actual coin hauls and findings from that region uh, yeah, are very hard to grasp. There are very few of that. And that, of course, also makes it difficult to eventually answer these, uh, these kind of important questions. Thank you very much. So we're almost uh, out of time, but there is one of the questions from the audience. Uh, sure. uh, Don Squires asks, one of the coins with a portrait of Faustina has her name in the accusative. Is this significant? All of the others have her name in the nominative. Mm -hmm. I think it was the Hypernicus coin. No, I think it's the Hypernicus. Oh. Uh, Yeah, I think it's it's this one. Yeah, it's Faustinan uh, Sebaste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, and it it's not a, a Manos Pillar Romayos type that I have shown. So this is from the Hypernikes coin. So they are um, also comparable ones. Um, but now we have just uh, focused on 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 this. Uh, I think it has also something to do that there are some variations also in the legend of the reverse, mm -hmm. both in the obverse and in the reverse, and also more variations in the iconography, which from our point of view um, points to the fact that the Manos Filler Romayos group was created as a close series for a special occasion, mm -hmm. while the Hypernikus coins were running uh, for, for a probably longer um, period of time. But, uh, you, you are absolutely right that this is a fascinating and also fascinating question. As Elizabeth has said, um, um, these coins are also rarely studied and we have just mm -hmm. begun actually yeah. to, to look at them. What is very clear is that there, um, the writing of the legends uh, becomes very much confused. So you have many types where you... Uh, cannot read very clearly Hypernikis Romai on you. I have many abbreviations, uh, many variations uh, that are running, and uh, I suppose that uh, also the accusative is uh, is uh, pointing to that, which also suggests then that this was a kind of different yeah, background in which these coins were minted. I think there's it's definitely a very interesting point. Yeah. I think um, one should really have a further look at. And as Sven has said, and unfortunately, or for us, luckily, <laughs> um, yeah, there was not much um, studies. Uh, studies on on these coins. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, now it's uh, two o'clock, uh, and I have uh, like a lot of compliments uh, coming for you. Oh, thank and, you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this incredibly interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation, really. And uh, yes, we're looking forward uh, to, of course, having you collaborating more with ANS. And uh, thank you again. Okay. Thanks all for coming and uh, yeah, enjoying. This talk. Thanks. Hot weather. Thank you so much. Marie. Have a wonderful day and weekend. <laughs> bye, bye bye. Yeah, yeah. Bye bye. Ciao ciao. Ciao. ciao.